History books are riddled with tales of great men. Their feats often aggrandized by chroniclers who sought favor with their patrons. What's less common are leaders whose accomplishments haven't been sufficiently accounted for. The 16th century Afghan ruler of Hindustan, Shir Shah Suri, is an excellent example of this. His brief reign as the supreme sovereign of northern India is often remembered as being an interregnum between Mughal rule in the subcontinent. But such a judgment is harsh and unfair, for it leaves us ignorant to the wide scope of social and economic reforms he made, which the Mughals gratefully inherited upon their return to power. Despite the grandeur of his achievements, Shir Shah Suri failed to write his own story down. As a result, we are dependent upon Mughal sources. Considering the enmity between the Suris and the Mughals, we can see why this is problematic. For instance, the Tarikhi Shir Shahi that was commissioned by Emperor Akbar in the 1580s doesn't go into any real detail about the early years of Shir Shah. What we do know is that he was born as Farid Khan in Sasaram, Bihar, near the Bengal. The year of his birth is given as either 1472 or 1486. His grandfather Ibrahim Khan Suri had migrated down from Afghanistan to northern India as a horse trader who settled and became a Jagirdar, meaning landlord, in Narnul. The Suri are a Pashtun tribe and in the time period we are discussing, the terms Afghan and Pashtun were interchangeable. It's also important to note that Afghanistan and India had very real links and migration from the rugged mountainous land in the north to the fertile plains of Hindustan was very common in the medieval period. In fact, the dominant power in northern India at the time of Farid Khan's birth was the Lodi Delhi Sultanate, another Pashtun dynasty. His father Hassan Khan had changed the profession from a trader to a soldier in the service of various regional rulers, until he was given an ikta in Sasaram where he settled. An ikta was a form of tax farming common throughout the Middle East and India. Hassan Khan served the Lodi dynasty, apparently excelling in military service, something that his son Farid Khan would follow him in. From the little information that we have about his early life, we know that Farid Khan rebelled against his father's wishes and left home to enlist as a soldier, going on to become a mercenary soldier for the Lodis. In the 1520s, he picked up the title Shir Khan whilst in the service of Bahar Khan Lohani, the Pashtun governor of Bihar, for his valour and after supposedly killing a tiger single-handedly, Shir being the Persian word for lion. The governor even appointed him as his deputy and tutor to his son. He would only become known as Shir Shah when he became an independent ruler in the Bengal during the 1530s. After Babur invaded India in 1526, Shir Shah would continue his wandering military service under the Mughals. Whilst in the Mughal camp, Shir Shah was introduced to Babur who remarked upon seeing him that the eyes of this Afghan indicate turbulence and strife mongering. He ought to be confined. This apprehensiveness was mutual as Shir Shah soon left. When the aforementioned governor of Bihar died in the late 1520s, he was succeeded by his minor son Jalal Khan and Shir Shah was left to serve as his regent. Eventually, Jalal Khan became disgruntled with his regent who monopolized power in his own hands and so a plot was organized against Shir Shah that included the powerful Sultan of Bengal to the east. Tensions came to a head at the Battle of Surajgarh in 1534, 
where Sher Shah defeated his opponents and stepped up from the shadows to become the official governor of Bihar. Having thus created a power base for himself, he sought to reorganize his realm's administration and supplement its expansion by maintaining a well-disciplined army. To his east, the Sultanate of Bengal was going through its own internal issues. Sensing an opportunity to elevate his status from a petty regional governor, Shir Shah set his sights on his wealthy neighbour. A thriving and bustling centre of commerce thanks to its maritime trade, the Bengal would have been enviously viewed by any sovereign of the day. Despite teaming up with the Portuguese colonists, the Sultan of Bengal was decisively defeated by Suri in 1538. Meanwhile, the political situation in the rest of northern India remained turbulent. Even though Babur had supplanted the Delhi Sultanate, Mughal control over the region was not yet solidified. Babur's successor, Humayun, continued from where his father left off. But the ambition of Sher Shah Suri out in the east ensured that at some point the two men would butt heads together for dominance over Hindustan. The fact that Suri was on the verge of conquering the Bengal greatly alarmed Humayun, who rode out east to confront the Afghan. The two finally met at the Battle of Kosa in June 1539. After both sides dug themselves into trenches, Humayun decided to create a breakthrough by using diplomacy. He would allow Suri to rule Bihar and Bengal as provinces granted to him rather than undermining Mughal prestige by declaring outright sovereignty. And in a face-saving exercise, Humayun's troops would charge Shir Shah's forces who would retreat in fake fear. Suri accepted. Everything took place according to plan and the Mughal forces went back to their camp in celebratory mood. The crafty Afghan, however, saw this as an opportunity to outfox the Mughal emperor. Going back on his word, he attacked the relaxed Mughal forces, which were routed. Emperor Humayun survived the affair by jumping into the Ganges river and swimming away. With the Mughals retreating to lick their wounds, Shir Shah was now free to complete his conquest of Bengal. The following year, the two sides met in battle once again at Kanauj, where the Mughals were once again decisively defeated. Humayun was now forced to flee Hindustan, first via Sindh, then Afghanistan, and from there to Safavid Persia. That was not the last India would hear of Humayun. On the back of such victories, Shir Shah Suri immediately moved his capital to Delhi and set about to become the supreme ruler of northern India. From Delhi, he crossed into the Punjab, capturing the key city of Lahore. From there, he marched northward in order to defeat the Gakkar tribes near Rawalpindi, in the process constructing a key fort at Rohtas to ensure the suppression of the always problematic Gakkars. Feeling secure with his newfound power, Suri now turned his attention to administrative issues. He laid reforms for his new empire that included the introduction of the rupiah system, which still serves as the basis of the monetary system in India and Pakistan. His government's efforts in establishing good quality coinage was inherited by the Mughals later on. Shir Shah is also often remembered for helping to rebuild and revive the Grand Trunk Road, which connected the Bengal to Afghanistan in Central Asia. He ordered caravansarais to be laid out for the travellers and merchants using the route. To further enhance the organisational structure of his realm, Suri also established an efficient postal system which relied on mail being carried by relays of horse riders. When the Mughals eventually regained their throne, they were aware of the utility of learning from Shir Shah Suri's reforms and overall administration of his realm. 
In fact, this was one of the main reasons that the Tarikh i Shir Shahi was commissioned by Emperor Akbar. Shir Shah continued his run of conquests through the early 1540s, spreading his authority to Sindh in the northwest and expanding into Rajasthan at the expense of the Rajputs. His industrious reign and life would come to an end in 1545 when he was besieging Kalinjar Fort. There, he was caught in an accident involving a mine and he later died from the burns he suffered. He was succeeded by his son Islam Shah, but the Suri Empire Shir Shah established would not survive a decade after his death, falling in 1555 to the returning Humayun who would regain the throne he lost to the Afghan. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe to keep up to date with my latest videos. As usual, I want to thank my patrons for their generous support. If you guys want to support the channel, there's a link to my patron in the description to this video. Until next time, peace.